Bom, boa noite a todos. É, nós estamos, então, com a última atividade desses três dias de encontros do 23º Colóquio de Filosofia Unicinos e do 4 Simpósio Internacional de Filosofia da Medicina. É, eu, eu, como coordenador dos eventos, eu quero já, desde já, agradecer a participação de todos durante todos esses três dias de intensas atividades. É, Bianca, que está aqui comigo, é, participou Uh, com o bebê Matheus no colo uh, durante todos esses três dias. Né? Então, thank you, Bianca, very much. E, e eu já, desde pronto, uh, agradeço aos colegas que já estão aqui presentes. Né? Sofia Stein, nossa colega no curso de pós-graduação em filosofia. Sofia will be the coordinator of the debate. Uh, Nitamar, professor Nitamar de Oliveira, da PUC que é o nosso convidado para debater é, junto com Zoe Drayson, que é a nossa é, palestrante é, para finalizar os nossos eventos. É, eu vou deixar para a Sofia fazer as introduções e se tiver algum resumo é, dos currículos dos dois participantes, mas o meu objetivo aqui é basicamente agradecer a vocês, agradecer também especialmente ao Itamar, que sei que procurou até acompanhar um pouco as nossas atividades. Né? É, no sistema do, do Teams, a gente não se deu conta que é, nem todos é, ficam é, disponíveis visualmente e online, então em um determinado momento até, é, Itamar, te peço desculpas, te via lá como participante fazendo perguntas para nós escritas, mas a gente procurou uh, uh, valorizar elas ao máximo. Uh, os eventos foram bastante uh, intensos, então uh, eu sei que o pessoal já está cansado, mas tenho certeza que uh, uh, foi bem sucedido. Eu vou deixar para o final para fazer novos agradecimentos, mas então, de pronto, para a gente não passar muito tempo da apresentação, uh, eu vou passar para a professora Sofia Stein. Sofia, uh, please... And if you can introduce Zoe and Nitamar and uh, uh, coordinate the, the debate, and actually the, the conference of Zoe Drayson. And thank you, Zoe Drayson, for your, for your uh, participation and, and, and thank you very much. So, uh, good evening. Uh, I thank you, Marco, for inviting me to be uh, the moderator tonight. And... Um, I, I congratulate all uh, that are uh, organizing this meeting, Bianca especially. It's uh, a pleasure to be here with Zoe Dryson and also Nitamar and uh, coordinating this, this session. Uh, Zoe will, will uh, give a lecture tonight, so about, about 45 minutes to an hour, and then we will have Anita Mar's comments on uh, her paper. Uh, Zoe Dryson is an assistant professor in philosophy at the University of California, Davis. She's also affiliate faculty in cognitive science and in the Center for Mind and Brain. Uh, she was previously researcher, fe fellow researcher at the University of Stirling, a uh, visiting fellow at the Center for Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh, and postdoctoral research fellow at the Australian National University. And uh, her research is primarily in philosophy of mind and the philosophy of cognitive science, including many areas as metaphysics of cognitive science, psychological explanation, unconscious cognition, uh, theories of perception, embodied and extended cognition. So uh, Zoe has um, many papers already published and she is uh, uh, known, I think, by our students a little bit already because of Bianca's work. And I, I will present also um, Nitamar, Nitamar um, Oliveira, our 
is a kind of colleague in Porto Alegre. No? <laughs> we work in the same city. And Nitamar uh, is, uh, is at the PUC, Rio Grande do Sul, Pontifícia Universidade Católica do Rio Grande do Sul, a professor for many years right now and very well known in Brazil because she, he is leading the evaluations of all um, graduate courses in philosophy in Brazil at, at this moment. And um, Nitamar has a, a long uh, also CV. Uh, he, she, he ended a PhD, a dissertation on uh, Kant, Nietzsche and Foucault in, at Sunny in New York and uh, has also a master in Pennsylvania and also uh, some a master and a PhD in theology, yeah, one in France. And so um, I, I won't, uh, I won't read all Nitamar's <laughs> CV, but oh. uh, <laughs> uh, Nitamar has many papers uh, already uh, speaking about the philosophy of neuroscience, which is one of the issues he is right now um, worried about. Huh? And I think it will be a really nice debate tonight within Zoe and Nitamar. So I will just coordinating the, the final uh, questions and answers uh, session. So have a I, I now, Zoe, you can start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Sophia, for the introduction. I'm really looking forward to hearing what Nitamar has to say. Um, and thank you so much to Marco and Bianca for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I was hoping to make it a trip to Brazil in person, um, but even just doing this over Microsoft Teams is um, really, uh, um, it's really special. It's very nice to be part of your colloquium and um, I barely leave my house these days. So it's really nice to uh, be interacting with uh, my fellow scholars in this. So I'm going to sh share my screen now and hopefully this will work. OK, I'm trusting that somebody will tell me if this doesn't work. <laughs> I will tell you. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. OK. So let me just start my timer so I know how long I'm talking. Um, OK, so what I'd like to talk about today is uh, the role of philosophy in cognitive science. So I hope this is a, a sort of a topic um, that um, interests a pretty broad range of people, even those who aren't sort of specialists um, um, in any one of these areas. And to start with, I want to show you this diagram. So anybody who's worked on cognitive science will have seen this diagram. It's uh, from the Sloan Report on Cognitive Science in 1978. So when cognitive science was just getting up and running, um, they published a report trying to kind of say what cognitive science was, what it involved. Everybody knew that cognitive science was uh, an interdisciplinary effort. Um, but what disciplines did it involve? And uh, this diagram became quite famous in its own right. Um, you can see um, uh, philosophy uh, represented there, psychology, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, anthropology and linguistics. I've never fully understood what the dark lines as opposed to the dotted lines are supposed to mean. Um, but the idea here is that cognitive science is an interdisciplinary effort um, so that these different disciplines are all part of cognitive science. So philosophy is a part of cognitive science. 
Now, what I'd like to look at today is the past, present and future of philosophy's role within cognitive science. So first of all, I'm going to look at the past and I'm going to ask why was philosophy considered an integral part of cognitive science? Um, it's not always obvious now what philosophy brings to cognitive science, why cognitive science needs philosophers. So I want to talk a bit about the history of cognitive science and show why philosophy was so important to it. Then I want to skip to the present. Um, how does philosophy play a part in contemporary cognitive science? So I think philosophy's role in contemporary cognitive science is a little bit different, um, partly because of the directions that cognitive science has taken. So I'll talk a bit about um, sort of embodied cognition movements and non-representational approaches to cognition there. And I think that raises some real questions about um, how we approach um, philosophy of cognitive science as philosophy of science, as a scientific discipline. And then finally, I want to look at the future of philosophy within cognitive science um, and ask, will philosophy remain part of cognitive science in the future? There is a very long history of um, philosophical subjects that then developed into their own sciences um, and which are no longer considered part of philosophy as a result. So things like physics, things like psychology, and so you might wonder if the same thing is going to happen with cognitive science. Um, and I think it's possible, but I do think there are distinctive roles that philosophy plays in cognitive science, um, which um, are really important uh, to cognitive science and uh, can be done purely scientifically. So I'll discuss those a bit at the end. So let's start with the past. That's uh, Gottlob Frege on the left and Alan Turing. So cognitive science grew up in the 1960s and 70s. And before that time, um, the mind was being studied mostly by philosophers um, because it wasn't clear how anything physical like the brain um, could be responsible for thought. So thought has these special characteristics. Thoughts are about things, they have intentionality. Um, relationships between thoughts are inferential. And for a very long time, I mean going certainly this is something that Descartes commented on, um, for a very long time, uh, the meaningful relations between propositional thought were understood as something that couldn't be reduced to causal relations between physical states. It was just assumed that mental states couldn't be identified with states of the brain because mental states have these properties and relations which we don't see in the physical world. So the idea was that we can't build a machine that thinks. Thinking's not the kind of thing that a machine can do. Now the birth of cognitive science uh, came out of two key developments. So at the very end of the 19th century, um, beginning of the 20th century, philosophers like Frege, also Russell, um, demonstrated the inferential relations between propositions things with meaning could be formalized into formal relations between symbols. So this was just the birth of uh, propositional logic and the predicate calculus. Um, and it was really important in showing that um, we could formalize um, meaningful transitions so that semantic relations between thoughts could be modeled as syntactic relations between symbols. And that was really important um, because it was that work by Frege and Russell 
um, that then led pretty much to Turing's uh, work on computability. Because once it was discovered that we could formalize um, our uh, meaningful propositions, so our, our thoughts and their relations to each other, um, Turing showed that um, the formalizations, so the syntactic uh, proofs that we had, could be implemented in physical systems. And that's just, I'm taking it, that's just what it is to be a computer, is to be a, 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 a physical machine that uh, transitions between formal symbols. So the idea here is that um, uh, Turing demonstrated that the work of Frege and Russell could be implemented into our physical system. So you can see that right from the start, philosophy played a very important role in cognitive science. So cognitive science, as we'll see in a moment, um, grew out of Turing's work on computability. And Turing's own work on computability grew out of Frege and Russell's work on formal systems. So Turing's uh, insights into computation uh, were made possible by the work of logicians and other philosophers. And the founding idea of cognitive science was based on Turing's insight. Um, so the idea is that cognition can be understood as computing. Roughly that our uh, uh, brains are the hardware that implements the software of the mind. Now there's different ways to inter interpret this claim. So a weak interpretation just is the idea that um, when we do cognitive science, we're using computational models to give a causal explanation of mental phenomena. There's a stronger interpretation, though, and that's the claim that cognition just is computation. So there's nothing more to cognition than computation, and cognition is constituted by computation, and that mental states are defined by their functional roles. So on this stronger interpretation, it's not just that computational modeling helps us understand cognition. On this stronger interpretation, it's the claim that mental states are internal symbols which represent aspects of and the mental processes are computational transitions over these internal representations. Uh, and so the idea of cognition as computation, according to uh, the weak interpretation, just says we use computational models to understand cognition. Um, philosophers were instrumental in uh, thinking about this stronger interpretation, okay, claiming that there is nothing more to cognition than computation. So cognition as computation was taken by many philosophers to be a metaphysical claim. So not just a claim about how we can give scientific accounts of cognition, but as a claim about the nature of cognition, what it is to be a mind, what it is to be a mental state um, uh, is given by computation. And so that's uh, where philosophers became very much involved um, in the cognitive science of the 1970s and 80s. Um, and a lot of the time what they were doing is they were making metaphysical claims. So their involvement wasn't so much in the logic side of things anymore and the formal systems. Um, it was in the metaphysics of mind. Um, so taking this popular idea of functionalism, that mental states are defined by their functional roles and identifying those functional roles with computational roles. 
So that's the part. Now I want to say something more about the present. OK, so going back to the Sloan report from 1978 again um, that I showed you that diagram before. The Sloan report says what has brought the field that's cognitive science into existence is a common research objective to discover the representational and computational capacities of the mind and their structural and functional representation in the brain. So that makes it sound like um, they're very much taking this metaphysical picture, the strong interpretation of cognition as computation. The idea here is it's just assumed um, that um, uh, the mind has representational and computational capacities. But that's what it is to be a mind. Now that's interesting because if we assume that cognition is by its very nature computational and representational, or if we want to say by definition or essentially that cognition is computation and representation, then what do we want to say about cases of seemingly intelligent behaviour um, which seem non-computational and non-representational? And I'll look at an example in a moment. But notice that there are two ways of answering these sorts of questions. If we observe some kind of intelligent behaviour in a human being or other animal, and um, uh, we say, oh, that's clearly, there's clearly something cognitive going on here. Um, and then we discover that the processes that produce this behaviour are not computational processes. What do we say then? Well, here's one thing you can say. You can say these are not genuine cases of cognition. You might say even that they're not cases of genuinely intelligent behaviour. It's just behaviour that looks intelligent but isn't. Um, or it's just... Uh, 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 looks like it was produced by cognitive processes, but it wasn't actually produced by cognitive processes because cognitive processes are computational and there's no computation here. And that was a line that was kind of reasonably popular, I think, in the in the 1980s. Um, whenever anybody suggested alternative models for cognition was to say, oh, well, these aren't cognition because we've discovered that cognition is computation. And so anything that you show us that doesn't involve computation can't be cognition. OK. That's one route to take. The alternative is to say that in cases like these, what we've discovered is that it's possible for cognition to be something other than computation. Um, so we can say this is intelligent behaviour or this is produced by cognitive process, but they're just not computational processes or representational processes. OK, and that um, in essence has really become uh, the more dominant way to understand understand cognitive science. Um, so you have non-computational mo models within cognitive science. So here's the example that I promised you. This is an outfielder in baseball. Um, I know very little about baseball, by the way, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice example. OK, how do we explain what's going on when the outfielder catches the ball? Um, according to uh, computational cognitive science, um, the fielder is unconsciously processing sensory information, so visual information about where the ball is and how fast it's coming to them. Um, the fielder is unconsciously calculating the trajectory of the ball, figuring out where the ball will land given its current location and its speed predicting a landing space for the ball and then uh, deciding where uh, to run, how fast to run, 
um, what direction to run in order to catch the ball. That's the computational explanation of what's going on here with the outfield. Now, so some interesting work in embodied cog sci um, cognitive science came up um, uh, in mostly in the 90s. Um, uh, and they showed that fielders, the fielder can catch the ball simply by doing one of two things. So either by moving lateral so as to make the ball appear to trace a straight line, or if the fielder aligns themselves with the path of the ball and runs in a way that makes the ball appear to have a constant velocity, they will end up at the same place as the ball when it lands. Now, what's interesting about this explanation is that it seems to um, uh, it seems to play down the role of computation. It seems to suggest that we don't need to talk about someone's uh, brain processing uh, sensory information and using it to calculate the trajectory of the ball and making a decision about when to run and where to run. The claim is here that um, just by um, Really, that just by coupling um, uh, their actions with their perceptual inputs, um, that um, the fielder can achieve the same result without having to do any complicated computations. Okay, so that's um, one of the uh, important uh, bits of data that came up in the 1990s about cognitive science that suggested that computational explanations weren't the only way um, to get an explanation of what looks like intelligent behavior. They said, you know, some people are going to want to say that, um, well, it, we thought the outfielder was doing something cognitive, but they're not. But what people are more likely to want to say, no, no, he, he's doing exactly what he thought he was doing, and it's clearly intelligent. Um, but his cognitive processes just aren't computational processes. So what does this show? Just to recap, does it show that fielding the ball is a non-cognitive activity because it doesn't require computation and representation? Or does it show that the cognitive processes involved in fielding result from non-cognitive and non-representational processing? And this has led to a real debate within cognitive science about what cognitive science is the science of. And it becomes really interesting here because it looks like cognitive science faces questions and issues that a lot of other sciences don't. So traditional cognitive scientists claim that cognitive science is the science of the computational processes that produce the intelligent and flexible behavior. And we're assuming that to be cognitive, these processes are computational. On the other hand, you might think that cognitive science um, is the science of intelligent, flexible behavior, regardless of what causes it. Um, so people like uh, Tony Shimera, who I quoted there, have this idea of cognition as the, um, uh, the ongoing active maintenance of a robust animal environment system uh, closely achieved by closely coordinated perception and action. So the focus is on perception and action, like in the outfielder case. Um, and there's no talk there about computation, about information processing. And this is where philosophy of science um, has something to say. 
So it looks like some of these more contemporary debates about what, cog what cognitive science is a science of draw a lot more on resources from uh, philosophy of science more generally rather than from uh, metaphysics or from logic. So the disagreement within cognitive science looks like it's really different from the sort of disagreement that we get in other science. And I'm going to run through a couple of examples of this, uh, one from marine ge geology and one from astrophysics. So when marine geologists are asking how do coral atolls fall, okay, they have an idea, they have um, they all agree on what the phenomenon is that needs to be explained. It's the formation of coral. They have a uh, uh, they have different explanations of um, how this comes about. Similarly, in um, astrophysics, what explains gamma ray bursts? Everybody agrees on the phenomenon to be explained. It's the gamma ray burst, okay? but they disagree about which theory explains gamma ray bursts the best. So scientists generally in these other cases of disagreement are agreeing about what needs to be explained, but disagreeing about how to explain it. That's the standard case of scientific disagreement. When we look at cognitive science though, um, we see a very different kind of disagreement. So in the cases that I've raised, like the outfielder, people often don't agree about whether the phenomenon is cognitive or not. Um, so if you think that uh, the outfielder's behavior can be explained without reference to, compu to computation, a traditional cognitive science would say, well, this isn't part of cognitive science then, because what's going on here isn't cognition. Um, it's just uh, it's just physiology, perhaps. Cognitive science is the study of cognition, which is computation. Um, and opposed to that, you've got the people who think that, no, the phenomenon to be explained here is the behaviour. And whatever processes produce this behavior are cognitive processes, regardless of whether they're computational or not. And so what we ended up with in cognitive science is um, a lot of philosophers um, trying to apply philosophy of science um, to these sorts of cases, trying to show um, what would be the case in other sciences, how it differs, what the similarities are, um, and basically just exploring the framework and methodology of scientific practice. And so this looks a lot more like standard philosophy of science than it does metaphysics or logic, for example. Um, I'm just going to check if I have time to run through these examples quickly. I do. OK, so. The example I mentioned of marine geology, what's the explanation of a coral atoll formation? So these rings of coral that you see in the sea. Well, here's two hypotheses. Um, one hypothesis says that there was an underwater mountain and the coral grew on top of it. Um, the other hypothesis says says that coral grew upwards on a sinking volcanic island. OK, so two hypotheses, you'll see they both predict or explain the same data as in what you see at the, uh, the surface of the ocean. Um, but they give a different story about how it comes about. Um, and in astrophysics, uh, the gamma ray burst, astrophysicists have different ways of accounting for gamma ray bursts. Um, so what you see in the middle there is effectively the gamma ray burst, um, but you see two different explanations there. One on the left is hypothesis one, and the one on the right is hypothesis two. And of course, 
referring to hypothesis one, um, stars in a binary system spiral inwards until they collide, and that's what it produces the gamma ray first. And according to hypothesis two, it's a red giant star that collapses onto its in, onto its core, becoming really dense, causing a supernova explosion, and that's the gamma ray burst. So you can see in both of these cases, the coral atoll formation and the gamma ray uh, um, uh, explanations, we've got what look like cases of standard scientific disagreement. Everybody agrees about what needs to be explained and that it's the job of this particular science to explain it. They just disagree about the details. Or is there something fundamentally um, more problematic going on um, in uh, contemporary cognitive science? Um, people aren't just disagreeing about um, uh, how certain phenomena are produced, they're disagreeing about whether those phenomena are part of cognitive science in the first place. And they're saying that the basically that the way we end up explaining them will determine whether they count as cognition or not. So there's been a lot of philosophical ink spilled over uh, these sorts of questions of how to understand cognitive science. And there's a, a very kind of of a predictable kind of push and pull between philosophers who want to start by defining cognition as computation and saying that anything that's not computation now doesn't count as cognition and therefore delimiting the domain of cognitive science. And on the other hand, those people who just want to look at what cognitive scientists actually do um, uh, and say that this is our best guide to what cognitive science is. So as I said, these are quite contemporary debates in cognitive science, and it looks like we've shifted as philosophers from uh, the focus on formal systems and logic um, and on the metaphysics more towards philosophy of science. So policing the boundaries of cognitive science, what counts as cognitive science, what doesn't count as cognitive science. So what about the future of philosophy's role in cognitive science? As I said at the start, there's a long history in philosophy um, of um, separate disciplines sort of breaking off from philosophy and being their own thing. So um, physics started out as natural philosophy. Um, these days you can do physics without doing any philosophy. Um, there are, of course, philosophers of physics who may look at this, but physics itself doesn't seem to require a background in philosophy. Similarly with um, psychology, uh, even biology, all of these disciplines were originally part of philosophy. So they were originally studied by philosophers. Um, and what happens gradually as they break away and they become their own discipline, then philosophy kind of takes a back seat. Yes, there are always philosophers interested in these subjects. So philosophy of biology, philosophy of psychology. Um, but um, you can be a psychologist or a biologist without being a philosopher. And so you might think this is what the future of cognitive science holds. You might think, well, philosophy uh, um, was the place where we were discussing things like mental state, thoughts, inferences. Um, but as we do more cognitive science, um, we learn how to think about these things in a more scientific way. And so it might be the case that lots of these things become part of cognitive science. Now, I've, I'm leaving it open there whether that means that they stop being part of philosophy. I think there's absolutely room for them still to be part of philosophy as, uh, as well. Um, but the idea that you'll be able to be a cognitive scientist 
without being a philosopher. Um, and I think that we're kind of in some ways almost there. The way that cognitive science um, is um, studied in lots of places now, um, it's studied very much from a scientific perspective. Um, and a lot of the philosophical questions are neglected. So I think we may already be going in that way. I want to say something about a couple of topics um, that um, have been talked about over the, the past couple of days. Um, and that's topics like consciousness, consciousness, sorry, and personhood. So I think there is something about um, these aspects uh, of the mind that make it very difficult for cognitive science to take them on purely scientifically. So I do think that there are um, aspects of which it's going to be very difficult for cognitive science to just take over and study scientifically. Um, but for different reasons in these two cases. So the reason that consciousness um, can't be studied, let's say, purely scientifically, purely objectively, is that it has this subjective element to it. Um, that one of the things, at least, that we're, we're interested in when we study consciousness is um, this what it is like phenomenon, um, what it feels like to the experiencer from the inside. Um, and that's not something, that's not a piece of data that can be studied scientifically. Now, there are lots of things we can study scientifically that correlate with it. And you may think um, that's enough. Um, it's very difficult in the case of consciousness, though, to say that consciousness might turn out to be something other than we thought it was. OK, there are other cases of scientific explanation where we start out trying to explain one thing and discover that we're actually we've actually misconstrued the phenomenon. So if you think about people trying to study um, uh, the sun's rotation around the Earth every day, okay, realize that what they were in fact studying is not the sun's rotation around the Earth, it's the sun's apparent rotation around the Earth because of the Earth's rotation around the sun. Um, so that's a case where we often, um, uh, in science, turn out to actually be explaining something different from what we thought we were initially. And something like this goes on in the science of consciousness, where um, people say things like, well, we've discovered that consciousness is just, um, is just neurons firing at 40 hertz, okay? Um, and so a lot of philosophers are gonna say, no, you've discovered something really interesting there um, about these correlations between consciousness and uh, the frequency of, uh, of neurons. But you haven't, um, you haven't explained what consciousness is because you haven't explained the first person elements of it. And so the question is whether science can say, oh yeah, but it turns out those don't need to be explained. We were, we, it turns out that all we have to do is explain all the third person stuff and not the first person stuff. Um, so a lot of philosophers feel that that's simply changing the subject, um, that um, we know what consciousness is uh, in a way that's um, different to how we know everything else about the world in the sense that we experience it from the first person. So scientists can't tell us, well, um, it's not what you thought it was. They've just changed the subject. They're explaining something else. The other um, topic that I think is important here is um, personhood. So what makes somebody a who are persons? Are only human beings persons? Can there be 
uh, non-human animal persons? Can there be uh, uh, non-organic uh, persons, artificial persons? Um, and ideas about personhood and the self are really, really difficult to study scientifically. Again, it's an area where we can get lots of, uh, lots of scientific insight into aspects of these processes, but ultimately it looks like personhood has a moral element um, that science isn't going to uh, explain. Um, once we we decide perhaps what constitutes this moral element and science might help us figure out which things are persons and which things aren't. But science isn't going to settle the question um, or of whether we ought to consider a certain being a person or not. So these are two topics that I do feel are uh, uh, more likely to um, retain this connection between philosophy and cognitive science um, in the sense that they can't we can't split off this kind of purely scientific component of it because there is this either a normative or a, a subjective phenomenological perspective. But now what I want to talk about is um, Back to metaphysics. So I started out by saying that one of the um, initial roles of philosophers within cognitive science was taking these computational explanations of um, uh, of the mind and claiming they were metaphysical explanations, claiming that when we say cognition is computation, we learn something about the nature of cognition. Um, and these metaphysical physical uh, approaches have kind of fallen along the wayside over recent years. Um, and that's because of the kinds of things I was talking about before. People are generally pretty loath to say cognition is, is essentially computation, therefore anything not computational can't be cognitive. Um, People are generally much more open to looking at what cognitive scientists are doing and saying, OK, whatever explanation this has, this is still cognitive science. So a lot of the metaphysical claims have kind of taken a back seat. Now, I want to suggest um, that uh, we're going to see a return to metaphysics. Um, uh, my reason for thinking this, of course, is sort of purely selfish, um, that I am really interested in thinking about the uh, naturalistic metaphysics of cognitive science. Um, but um, I just want to, to bring this up um, uh, to suggest um, that perhaps there is a role for philosophy in the future of cognitive science um, within metaphysics. Um, even though we don't want to say the things that the metaphysicians of old were saying. So when I talk about a return to metaphysics, it's a specific kind of metaphysics. OK, so you may be familiar with um, some of these books and people. Um, so naturalized metaphysics um, is the term that's often used to describe it or metaphysics of science. Um, and the idea here is roughly that metaphysics doesn't have to be what we thought it was previously. So if we think back to what the original metaphysicians were doing in cognitive science, they were aiming to uncover necessary and sufficient conditions for something to count as a mind or as a mental state. OK, this is a traditional approach to metaphysics in the sense that it involves doing a conceptual analysis and figuring out um, what necessary and sufficient conditions for falling under these concepts are. 
Um, and um, all of this was done in a roughly a priori way. Now, recent naturalistic trends in philosophy have led to lots of questions about the role of a priori reasoning, about the status of uh, intuitions in uncovering the nature of the world. Um, some people, um, so if you think back to, um, uh, so if you want to think about, for example, positivists, um, um, who might say, well, um, a a priori reasoning doesn't tell us anything about the world, so there is no metaphysics, or there is no substantial serious metaphysics, and so it gets thrown out. That's not what's going on. The idea is that there's more to metaphysics than a priori theory. The idea is that metaphysics may well be more scientific um, than we traditionally thought that maybe uh, our metaphysical theories are actually reached by inference to the best explanation, the same way as our scientific theories are. And so there's a lot of work in this area um, that um, suggests not just a new role for metaphysics, but in particular a new role in metaphysics um, as it applies to science. And a lot of the uh, people whose uh, uh, books and pictures I had up on the previous slide have done this by looking at um, are very big on philosophy of physics. They think, right, if we're going to have a metaphysics, um, then a uh, scientifically driven metaphysics, then let's um, what we need to do is to be starting by understanding what physics says, because that's where all the fundamental stuff happens. So I don't think that I don't think that the fundamental is important as, as important as some people do. Um, and I am interested in thinking about applying these naturalistic metaphysical ideas to uh, the special sciences and in particular to cognitive science. And what this gives us is new possibilities for collaboration between philosophers and scientists uh, throughout the sciences. So I think there are, you know, there was definitely a time when scientists said, wait, why do we have philosophers telling us what to do? Why do we philosophers, why do we have philosophers telling us what causes are, for example, or what laws are and driving our research that way? Um, because they've just figured it out from their armchairs on their own. And I think, um, that led obviously to very much a certain divide between philosophers and scientists. The current work in naturalistic metaphysics um, suggests something else because it's not about philosophy um, from the armchair coming up with theories and then forcing the scientists to adopt them. Quite the opposite. It's about drawing on the scientific theories in order to develop some of their more theoretical consequences. And so that seems to give philosophers and scientists a way to actually uh, interact more. And if we think about this in terms of cognitive science, it looks like that uh, we have a new role for philosophy in cognitive science going forward. So initially, um, the philosophy um, brought to cognitive science, this um, focus on formal languages and logic, um, and then initially these sort of a priori metaphysical claims. And I said it's turned more recently into um, pretty just straightforward philosophy of science. It's become very unclear what cognitive science is supposed to be a science of. Um, but I'd like to suggest going forward um, that there is a real place for metaphysics in cognitive science done as metaphysics of cognitive science, taking its starting point from the cognitive science rather than from uh, intuition and a priori reasoning. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Zoe, uh, for your presentation. For your presentation. And uh, now Nitamar will uh, make his comments. All right. First of all, let me thank Sofia and Marco for the invitation. Congratulate the organizing committee for putting together this magnificent event. I thank Abianca and all the uh, organizers. And let me thank Professor Zoe Drayson for this beautiful talk. I really enjoyed your presentation. I found it extremely interesting and uh, very, very convincing. Uh, I would tend to agree with most of uh, the thesis or even uh, presuppositions uh, that were shared with us in your presentation. But for the sake of a good philosophical uh, debate, let me offer you uh, three sets of comments and ask you three questions overall, precisely relating to the three divisions of your brilliant presentation. First of all, thinking uh, in terms of the past, as you put in your uh, presentation, past, present, and future. So first of all, thinking in terms of uh, machine functionalism or computational functionalism, or what, uh, what has also been called computationalism. Uh, as we all know, this uh, brain-mind analogy uh, has been there for a while. Uh, since uh, Turing himself, right? Uh, but we can also even think of uh, dating back to uh, uh, Descartes and to other uh, thinkers, uh, even before a modern uh, philosophy of mind. But uh, I think in my case that I, I came across this analogy when I was in my first job working with computers, this was back in the uh, late 70s, I was an engineering uh, student. And uh, at that time, there was a very popular vulgarizing text of uh, science uh, by uh, Jacques Monod, Chance and Necessity. This was the translation in English of uh, Le Hazard et la Necessité, which was also available in Portuguese and translated into many other languages. Uh, Monod was a Nobel Prize laureate in medicine for his uh, research in genetic engineering. So most uh, computer engineers and people interested in uh, electronic engineering were reading this book. And it was very interesting that this book uh, made very popular this analogy of uh, comparing the hardware to the brain, just like the software would be compared to mind process and this was precisely what functionalism is all about, as you mentioned in the uh, idea of uh, functional roles and symbols. Uh, and uh, we think actually that uh, computational neuroscience emerged in 1985, as we think of uh, Eric Schwartz's uh, computational neuroscience uh, classic from 1990. We may also think of a Paul and Patricia Churchland's uh, contributions to uh, computational neuroscience. But it was very interesting that in your presentation, uh, when we think of uh, the emergence of a uh, cognitive science, uh, neuroscience was already one of the uh, disciplines, as you put it uh, in the uh, Sloan uh, slide of your presentation. And, uh, the neuroscientific turn itself was taking place in the 60s and 70s, of course, starting in, uh, in medicine, as we think of physiology, psychiatry, and other areas in, uh, in medicine, they undertook this neuroscientific turn. But it was very interesting that functionalism from the very beginning was one of the major uh, schools, uh, movements, or uh, fashionable ways of approaching mind-brain process. Of course, we can think of uh, many criticisms already offered in, uh, in the 1980s, as we think of uh, John Searle's uh, Chinese Rome experiment, uh, 
or the idea that syntax alone cannot account for semantics in his criticism of strong artificial intelligence and so forth. We can also think of a Putnam's triviality argument uh, and it has also been uh, uh, counter-argumented by uh, defensors of uh, uh, functionalism that counterfactual conditionals uh, themselves could satisfy uh, the implementation of a computational model, as we, we find also these arguments elaborated uh, by Fodor and others when they think of a representational properties that would be more than simple syntactic rules. You mentioned some of these ideas, but basically the, the problem here is could a machine think? Could the mind itself be a thinking machine? And of course, you, you gave us some uh, clues to uh, a critical approach to the, uh, this problem. For instance, when you mentioned embodied cognition and uh, itself uh, could be also related to this neurophenomenological approach that many uh, phenomenologists like uh, Dan Zahavi, Sean Gallagher and many others pursue in a neurophenomenological approach to mind brain process. We also think, think of Varela and uh, the so-called Santiago School that have this uh, kind of approach very much in terms of dynamical systems and uh, this uh, integration of uh, organism and environment. So my first question here is how would you respond to this uh, sustained uh, critique of a functionalism or the criticism against computational uh, functionalism. I was just wondering what would you make of these uh, criticisms. Now, a second set of uh, comments I'd like to offer in the very idea uh, of uh, a science of cognition. As you mentioned, what is cognition all about? I found your illustrations of marine geological and cosmological formations extremely interesting and helpful. So I have a question here about social aggregation as you think of a formation in the human species, as we think that temporal and bodily perceptions evolved together with the biological evolution of the neocortex. In other words, as we think with uh, Patricia Churchland, for instance, or Michael Gazzaniga, that the very development of the neocortex or the human brain was taking place together and also in a very inter interesting interaction with social cultural evolution itself. Like when humans started uh, domesticating animals, when they started uh, cooking their food and so forth. So uh, my question here is precisely how from uh, an evolutionary standpoint you tackle this very problem of consciousness and personhood that you raised in the third part of your presentation. Because as we bring this to the second part of your presentation, when, when you talked about cognition, the question I'd like to raise related to the question of consciousness and personhood is precise it's precisely that of sociality. So uh, Michael Gazzaniga's idea of a social brain is precisely that it's only thanks to sociality that a human cognition transcends uh, whatever is taken to be uh, only a limited understanding of a representational or even, uh, let's say, propositional approaches to knowledge and computation. So my question here is very much in terms of a sociality. How would you uh, account for cognition without also uh, allowing for the possibility of transcending propositional cognition and computation? 
And finally, our third set of uh, comments and questions that uh, I thought I, we could raise would relate to the very uh, idea that thinking in terms of uh, the future, we can think that philosophers of science, as they analyze and explore the conceptual frameworks and methodology of scientific practice, they are also calling into question the very ideas of correlation, for instance, was one of the words uh, you used in the third part of your presentation. One of the major questions we uh, raise when we are conducting experiments in the Brain Institute, for instance, when we have philosophers working together with neuroscientists, especially people coming from the medical sciences, linguistics, uh, computer science, uh, is precisely how come neurocorrelates are not necessarily causal? So it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon uh, that even when you work with uh, neuroimaging or when you are trying to work with uh, decod decoding and coding uh, experiments with neuroimaging like fMRI, uh, dots and colors, etc. cetera, do you interpret this uh, uh, a flow of blood in the brain for uh, brain activities, etc. they are not necessarily to be read in a causal sense. Of course, most neuroscientists know that, but this is not usually the way some people uh, that come from, uh, let's say, a more, uh, let's say, uh, reductionist approach to naturalism could speak of neurocorrelation, precisely because it's not always the case that you can think of a, a mental process without necessarily invoking the neurocorrelates from brain state standpoint. In other words, if on the one hand, we can almost assume that all mental states do presuppose some kind of a brain state at some point, it's not necessarily the case that whenever you're going to be talking about immaterial and uh, abstract uh, interpretations, uh, meaning, uh, intentionality, and so forth, even uh, consciousness, we are necessarily simply uh, responding to some kind of a neuro uh, correlated uh, explanatory uh, set of uh, explanations, let's say. So I see here that uh, in my, at least in my uh, understanding of this problem, of this problem or this way of uh, putting this problem, problematizing this uh, very relationship between naturalism and uh, normativity, that it's almost uh, interesting to see that even though you cannot assume or take for granted a normativity from a non-naturalist approach, as we found, for instance, in Moore or even in Parfit, in Oxford School approaches to uh, ethics and moral philosophy. On the other way around, uh, it's not always the case that you can assume that normativity could be explained in naturalist uh, terms. So my question here is what you make of metaphysical naturalism and how do you relate it to human sociality and especially thinking of a human uh, morality or in terms of uh, moral sentiments, social emotions that contribute to a human understanding and self-understanding of empathy and uh, different uh, sentiments that are expressed in the human species. So it seems to be extremely interesting the way you uh, you uh, finished with a metaphysics because of course you can always go back to the first part of your presentation and revisit Frege and Turing, for instance, and come up with uh, more recent approaches to uh, Cartesian rationalism, for instance, of many neuro semantic. Uh, researchers who would resort to Chomsky and others 
who would say that after all, there are some interesting things to be uh, raised with a priori approaches to uh, syntax and semantics. Of course, you can think of Wittgenstein also as a very interesting example of a philosophy of uh, psychology that could be also quite interesting for neurophilosophy or philosophy of neuroscience. And my question to you is, would you think that these approaches would be also interesting for anyone doing work in uh, cognitive science like yourself? One question or of curiosity I'll have for you, uh, given your Scottish background, do you think uh, empiricism, like someone uh, like uh, Jesse Prince has done with his uh, rewriting of a Hume's uh, trilogy, has an edge over rationalism? Do you think it's really the best way to proceed, or is it something else that is missing in the way you talk about uh, metaphysics that, of course, it could allow to revisit many uh, uh, authors uh, from the past, but it's always a very interesting way of relating uh, naturalism to normativity, right? So another question I would have to you relating to this, uh, to the future of a cognitive science. How do you see this whole thing of a singularity? Do you think singularity will have any impact on ethics and moral philosophy. Uh, I'm very interested in this whole thing of uh, artificial intelligence ethics. We have some uh, doctoral students doing work in uh, AI ethics. And the very interesting thing, uh, Zoe, to see is that when we talk to people coming from computer science background, they usually are not very uh, sensitive to some of these problems and they become very amazed that we come up with some uh, questions that make their models, especially when people are only working with mathematical modeling for uh, AI, and uh, they think uh, the, that this uh, questioning and problematizing could be quite disruptive. For instance, just to give you a, a very typical example, it's very uh, convenient to simply resort to utilitarian models when we are doing AI ethics. Because, of course, anything that's utilitarian and can be quantified in terms of good or bad, positive or negative, can be very easy to be translated in, in terms of algorithms, right? But if you have anything deontological or if you think in terms of virtual ethics, like in Aristotelian models, or Kantian models, as you know, everything becomes more uh, confusing or at least doesn't seem to be very promising for uh, someone coming from computer science background. So my question to you is precisely, how do you think that uh, these AI ethics, precisely when they uh, have to deal with questions of normativity, could handle a metaphysical understanding of naturalism. Because as far as I understood your presentation, you seem to be allowing for uh, different readings of naturalism that would not necessarily go in one direction as opposed to another. So once again, thank you very much, Zoe. It was a great pleasure to uh, hear you and to learn a lot from you. I really enjoyed your presentation. I found it extremely interesting. And I hope uh, we can also get some other questions and comments from the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nidamar. I'll um, respond to that um, briefly. Um, I, I, there's so much I could say in response to that. And I think you, you've, um, yeah, you've hit upon some of the really, really core issues that I'm kind of fundamentally interested in here. Um, but I'll try to keep it quite brief so that we have time for questions. Um, so let's start with um, the questions about reconciling functionalism um, with neuroscience and so on. Um, so, hmm. Yeah, I think so. 
traditional cognitive science, traditional cognitive science, um, I'm thinking here of the kind of David Marr style three levels of explanation. Um, yeah, they're the way of reconciling the functionalist approach with looking at the, the neural details um, was simply um, to be thought of as two different projects. There's the question, what is cognition? As in, what, what can cognition possibly be? What is the essence of cognition? Whatever. Um, but then there's also the question about how, how how do how human cognizers work? And the question about neural implementation is always going to be relevant, always going to be relevant to the question of how human cognizers work or how animal cognizers or any in particular. But I take it the initial assumption was that if the question was just um, what is cognition? Um, what is a cognitive process? What is a cognitive capacity? The idea that that could be specified functionally. So just leaving open kind of what, um, what implemented it. And everybody agrees the implementation details then become important um, for saying, you know, how these creatures manage to do these things. But in doing so, we're going below the kind of the abstract level of cognition. Now that I think is is controversial because it assumes this very, very, very neat distinction between software and hardware. And it assumes that a science of cognition is ultimately um, something that we can give at the software level independently from the hardware that we can say what kinds of things minds are in a way that would enable us to identify minds that weren't implemented in brains and so on. Um, so yeah I think I mean, some of the backlash there, some of the people who were saying, like the Churchlands, who were saying, well, functionalism is ridiculous. Um, we need to, of course, we need to look at the brain. Um, a lot of mischaracterization. So nobody was ever saying not to look at the brain. Look at the brain if you want to know how human minds work. But a lot of people in early cognitive science were interested in what minds are, regardless of whether humans have them or not. Um, and I think that's something that um, is still a problem. So I teach um, uh, introduction to cognitive science and um, yeah, the, num the students have uh, a lot of problems trying to figure out the different approaches to the mind in terms of, well, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about how human minds actually do this? Or are we talking about how any mind could do this? And so, yeah, I think that's that's somewhere where there's still room for, for philosophers to, to come in and respond. Um, a question about um, social cognition and uh, evolution and sociality, um, I think is absolutely fascinating because this idea of transcending propositional cognition is is one close to my heart. I I do think um, that this tradition of focusing on language as um, language is the key to cognition um, is problematic in that we um, end up thinking of um, thoughts as kind of pseudo linguistic entities. And so we think the creatures that don't have language don't have thoughts because they don't have propositional thoughts. And then the question is, well, well are, are we just taking human beings, advanced human beings here? Are we taking this kind of this, um, uh, this as our, um, our paradigm case of cognition? Um, and um, I think there was definitely a lot of that going around in early cognitive science. So I think the idea was that there was just a massive discontinuity 
between cognitive individuals and non-cognitive ones. Cognitive ones were the ones who could articulate their thoughts um, sententially and so on, um, whose thoughts had truth values and represented the world. And then there were other creatures who might well do intelligent things, but didn't um, but didn't have propositional thoughts. And I think that one of the most interesting developments over the kind of over recent years in cognitive science has been this um, this focus on continuity um, and saying, look, we know that there's continuity in terms of the neural structure between humans and other animals. Um, um, we find continuity basically everywhere in nature. So I think the more of a naturalist you are, the more difficult it gets to defend the idea that there's something special about human cognition. Um, I would absolutely agree. I think, I mean, I side, I think, with people um, like, um, I guess, like Andy Clark, who want to say that um, language is really important because language is what enabled us to have the kinds of thoughts that we do. Um, so it kind of, you know, it, it, having a representational system allows us for, perhaps to um, think about our own thoughts, for example, to think reflexively. Um, but that that's just an extra tool that language has given us. And before that, we were still cognizers. We just didn't think quite like this. Um, so I think, I guess, sociality, certainly in terms of um, linguistic interaction, I think has been a, a huge driver there of um, uh, cognitive evolution. Um, so, mentioned um, ideas about correlation in neuroscience and ideas about causation and reduction and I yeah I love talking about this stuff because I firmly believe it's possible to be a naturalist without being a reductionist and I guess that's because I um, and this gets on to various other things that you said about about ethics as well so um, on one way of thinking about being being a naturalist, being a naturalist just says, look, there are no non-natural properties. There's nothing spooky. Everything is fundamentally supervenes in or grounded in the physical. Um, and that's the kind of idea that you get in, in ethics um, and so on. I guess I don't take a stance on that. So my kind of naturalism is just is neutral with regards to what we want to say about ethical properties and aesthetical properties. Natural naturalistic metaphysics and I suppose naturalistic epistemology um, um, are approaches that um, yeah I think minimize the role of intuitions and a priori thought and focus more on methodologies that philosophy and science can have in common so they focus on methodologies basically and they don't have to say anything about um, the fundamental properties that underlie that. And I also think that means that we can be naturalists without having to have a reductionist view where everything reduces to physics, for example. I think we can be naturalists and we can about do the metaphysics of cognitive science without asking, um, well, do these do these properties, what's the status of these properties? Do these reduce to fundamental physical properties or not, supervene or ground? I think these are interesting questions, but I think in, in a way that they can be um, set to one side um, here. Um, so issues about, for example, causation, I think, yeah, there's this idea of causation that was very prominent in early cognitive science, which is um, what's sometimes known as micro banging or just this reductive idea, the idea, the idea of causal oomph, that in order for one thing to cause an, another, it's basically it's like a billiard ball collision. Um, and um, yeah, in uh, computational neuroscience, we don't see that. Um, I guess this is another place where I think philosophers come in pretty useful 
um, because they have accounts of causation that don't require physical contact between particulars. Um, so whether they're counterfactual accounts of causation or um, interventionist accounts. And so I actually think we can do, um, yeah, we can get rid of a lot of the reductive stuff that came along with early cognitive science um, whilst retaining this idea that um, naturalist approaches Naturalist approaches um, to uh, philosophy, whether it's metaphysics, epistemology, are, are fruitful and productive um, without having, yeah, without going down the reductionist wormhole. That's ultimately, ultimately my aim is to find a way to justify being a non-reductive naturalist. Um, I'm not sure if that'll ever happen, but it's, uh, that's ideally um, how I'd like things to be. Um, you mentioned, uh, so thinking about um, a priori work relative to syntax and semantics and things. Yeah, and again, this is definitely a feature of my naturalism, which wouldn't be shared by some. So um, uh, John Ross and James Ladyman in their book, Everything Must Go, just basically say there's no room for any a priori thought, um, any a priori reasoning in metaphysics or anywhere well at all now i yeah i don't people need to be that extreme you can learn the lessons of uh quine's views on analyticity and so on without um taking them to this extreme and there are lots of naturalistic metaphysicians who um who do this um so um who argue for example that a priori reasoning is actually endemic to real science and so um, we can't get rid of it there and so why think we should be getting rid of it in philosophy and um, yeah I suppose that's um, that's that's a view that I'm 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 very much open to so in terms of yeah a priori work on syntax and semantics and things I think yeah there is obviously a massive role for a priori work in all kinds of fields um, I think one of the important things to distinguish, though, is between doing doing a priori work that tells us something about the nature of our concepts or our syntax or semantics, tells us about computability, and doing a priori work that we think tells us something about the nature of the world. So moving from the conceptual analysis to saying, and therefore this is how the world must be. Um, and I think that's where we have to be careful. But I do think there's a lot of, yeah, I mean, what you've talked about a lot is modeling and there has to be a huge role for modeling within cognitive science. And I think the question then about whether, whether our models represent reality is a further question that we can ask, um, but it doesn't invalidate the models at all. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I am not uh, going to answer any questions about the singularity because I <laughs> no, I had a I had a um, a graduate student of mine who's having a tough time choosing a dissertation topic and I've been working with her and trying to find something and she literally emailed me today and said I've got it I've got it the singularity I was just like no um, so Oh, so so yeah. I I guess I don't have too much to say about um 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 ethics regarding kind of technology and um so on. Um, except that I'm absolutely with you. I'm I'm yeah. Utilitarianism is uh, a very nice tool, but um uh, shouldn't be shouldn't okay shouldn't be mistaken for an ethical position. <laughs> That's maybe saying more than I wanted to, but yeah. And so I do think, um, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting ethical issues raised by new technologies and by cognitive science. I also think a lot of the time they are, in a way, they're raising issues that have always been around, just in a different way. Um, and um, yeah, I think obviously the need for the need. For for philosophers on the ethics side of thing, I don't think will ever go away.
Um, so yeah, I think that's an area in which cognitive science is, uh, yeah, is always going to need philosophers. But thank you. That was a really, really um, the super response. And I, yeah, I got a lot out of it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Thank you very much, Nitamar. We have some questions uh, at the key Q&A board here. Um, Zoe can also read it. I, I will read the question from Flavio Willings. So he said, he he asked me to say to you that he he's happy to see you again and uh, he has a question i have a very naive and general question cognition in human beings is an ordinary sense S seems to involve integrate integrative processes that include perceptual inputs, rational processing, and at the same time, emotions and a lot of processes that show the environment in an evaluative perspective as dangerous or pleasant. Do you think machines could learn to understand the world in an evaluative way? I mean, not only receive and decoding inputs and give certain output, but also a kind of cognition that could see reality as something with a certain meaning, interesting, cool, etc. Thank you. Um, hi, hi, Flavio. Um, Flavio came to visit us at UC Davis a couple of years ago. Um, um, thanks for the question, Flavio. Um, um, I don't think it's it's not it's not naive at all. I think um, it really get to something that's happened in cognitive science, which is, um, um, as Nitamar said, this very kind of Cartesian rationalist approach to things. So not Cartesian in the sense of, um, uh, in the sense of dualist, but Cartesian in the sense of um, focusing on rational processing. Um, and early cognitive science, um, took as its kind of remit to explain cognition, which they meant just reasoning, basically logical inference, um, rational thought. And a lot of them thought that's, that was all that cognitive science had to do, that there was other stuff that neuroscientists and psychologists and so on could do, but that didn't fall under the remit of cognition. Um, so that's the sense in which it was kind of hyper rational. Um, um, and there was this problem that behaviorism, which had been the dominant uh, view before, um, was basically being kind of, you know, cast out as uh, insufficient. And so there ended up being this huge divide um, in studies of the mind between people who study rational thought and people who just studied this other stuff that brains do that isn't cognition. Um, and um, yeah, I think that includes sort of kind of evaluative mental states, emotions and so on. Um, one of the things that I think has happened over the um, over more recent years is that. Yeah, people have realized you can't just separate these out. So um, what you talk about in terms of machines learning to understand the world in an evaluative way, yeah, I take it so reward systems the sorts of reward systems that um got a bad press because they were associated um uh with uh behavioral conditioning um those reward systems when they are internal to the brain um look like um they are uh enabling us to attach values to things um now the question then is, well, how does this integrate with um, more traditional cognitive science and computational approaches? And so, yeah, I think that's something where we can't keep these things separate. We can't say on the one hand, we've got neurotransmitters and on the other hand, we've got cognition. 
And this was a, a kind of a traditional approach, as I said earlier, that kind of separated out these two levels and said they've got nothing to do with each other. And I think people now are a lot more appreciative of the fact that not only do they have something to do with each other, but that they can influence each other. So that your evaluations can um, alter your rational thoughts and your rational thoughts can alter your evaluations. And so there's interplay there. Um, so yeah, I will say I think there is a lot of work being done on this, particularly with dopamine um, and the reward system um, and looking at what people can do with it. I, I, I don't know much more details than that though, but thank you for your question. Thank you, Zo thank you Zoe. There is another question here from De Eison Barcarolo, and he he's asking about the relation between intellect and computation. Is there a form or communication between the cognitive and the computational intellect that logic, mathematical logic is uses? Hmm. Uh, thank you. Thank you for translating that because I, I was interested to know what, what the what the question was. Um, yeah, uh, what's the relation between the intellect and computation? So I think this addresses something I um, alluded to earlier about the idea of um, cognitive science as trying to explain intelligent behaviour. So moving here from intellect to intelligence. Um, there are people who wanted to say, well, if it's intelligent, it's the product of the intellect, therefore it's cognitive, therefore it's computational. And that's again this very kind of Cartesian rationalist approach. And then there are people who think, no, you can just tell from looking at the behaviour whether it's intelligent or not. And they're thinking here in terms of flexibility or adaptivity. And so I don't think that they don't think that there's a necessarily a, a, a very strong connection here between um, intelligence and computation because they think that there might be other ways to, um, to get, get intelligent behavior. Um, I think one of the ways in which we've progressed in cognitive science is that people, I hope, are no longer looking for the one size fits all solution to the mind. So this was what was going on back in the, um, uh, the classical versus connectionist days. It was like, well, how does the mind compute? Does it do it like a physical symbol system? Does it do it like a connectionist parallel? distributed uh, network and uh, there were all kinds of a priori arguments put forward um, by I was going to say on both sides but largely by, largely on one side about why PDP networks couldn't um, be responsible for thought and I think people often ask me where that debate has gone and I think it's not so much that the debate has gone, the metaphysics underlying it has gone. So the assumption that cognition has to be identified with one thing or the other. And so instead, what we're doing is trying, trying to explain to cognition, and it might well be the case, some of our cognitive capacities um, are the product of physical symbol systems. So things that look very much like our digital computers. Um, good candidates for that might be things like, um, as you say, um, logical thinking, um, calculating and so on. Um, but then it looks like we have a whole suite of cognitive capacities that are would be better explained as um, parallel distributed processes. So anything involving kind of pattern detection here, so things like facial recognition. Um, um, uh, seems to fall into that category. Um, and there's a lot of research going on now into deep learning, into neural networks um, uh, that, um, yeah, that can actually learn to abstract and categorize things. So, yeah, I think I'm, I, I'm one of those people who just thinks, you know, let a, let, let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, I think there's absolutely room for uh, symbol processing ideas of, about computation and 
uh, artificial neural networks and so on. And I think the interesting thing is figuring out which explanation which best best fits which cognitive capacities. But thanks for the question. It's a great question. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you. I would have a question. <laughs> so the, the, there, there is no question uh, at this moment uh, at the, in the, on the board. So um, I, I am very curious about this uh, metaphysical naturalism. Um, so I know that everything in philosophy nowadays uh, is being being naturalized. <laughs> so I am a naturalist, but um, and I wrote uh, a paper um, relating uh, metaphysic philosophy of language and epistemology to naturalized philosophy of language. Uh, where I say that they are uh, similar, <laughs> but um, they are very close. But I wonder because you mentioned quines, uh, you mentioned quine, and uh, quine would say, I think he would say, if there is any relation between uh, uh, any kind of statement. Uh, and something empirical or some, something observational, then you shouldn't give attention to it because it is nonsense. So in some sense, Quine is still a positivist because, because he, he, he doesn't say we should uh, pay attention to, to any uh, metaphysical statement. So I wonder if, if there if there is no a kind of just a kind of um, definitional difference when you say when when you speak about naturalist metaphysic or naturalized metaphysic couldn't we just uh, speak about uh, scientific <laughs> theories or <laughs> because they have something uh, that it's not uh, strictly observational, obviously, but they are they this part of the uh, the, the uh, I think mathematical theories or something like that they, they are still related to something observational in quite sense. Uh, could uh, is that could you understand my question? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Sophie. Oh, it's it's a great question. So I'm actually I'm teaching a graduate seminar um, uh, this term um, on different forms of naturalism to our new first year graduate students. So we've covered naturalist metaphysics. We're on to naturalist epistemology now. We're going to look at naturalist approaches to the mind, naturalism. Then we look at natural approaches to, to mathematics and then to ethics, which I know very little about. Um, and it's it's really interesting because one of yeah one of the the real problems is to try and understand what all of these um, self-described naturalisms have in common um, because you're absolutely right some of them um, um, are um, are more scientific than naturalistic so yeah I think you know Quine. Um, Quine's take on this, and I'm thinking here of Quine's naturalized epistemology. He wants to say, well, there's no epistemology, there's just psychology. So rather than looking at wh whether people's beliefs are justified and how they ought to reason, uh, we should just be looking at how people actually reason in the real world. Um, but so Quine's whole approach there is guided by his behaviorism because how he was kind of pre or just on the, the early side of cognitive science there. And he thought that the only way to be scientific, naturalistic, was to be a behavior. Um, and so I think a lot of people have taken kind of taken Quine's insights and said, yeah, we should be naturalistic. Um, we should look to the science, but said, ah, oh, but that doesn't mean that we should be behaviorists. And it doesn't mean that we should focus on observation um, because this idea that um, 
this idea that science, scientific data requires um, objectivity and um, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, um, and the ability to to be observed, um, you know, publicly observable. Um, it's just a mischaracterization mischaracterization of science. There's a whole lot of science. Um, our scientists are theorizing about unobservables. They're trying to draw conclusions about unobservable things from observable things. And that's exactly the same as people in cognitive science are trying to do. They're trying to um, draw conclusions about, uh, say, you know, which computational algorithm the brain is running from what they can, um, what they can observe and measure. And so I think, yeah, I think a lot of contemporary naturalism is driven by the idea that Quine had the right idea but his idea of what science had to be um, was kind of messed up. And so that we can be naturalists um, without just being scientists. Now, if you're a naturalist, yeah, you have to believe, I take it, that there's no hard and fast distinction between at least the methodology of philosophy and the methodology of science. So you have to think that at some point, yeah, me doing metaphysics is going to shade into doing science. There are going to be more and less theoretical ways um, uh, uh, to use the scientific methodology. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I would focus on here. I do think so. I yeah, I, I don't side with the, the extreme naturalists who I think of as kind of of scientistic who basically um, they say that they don't want to get rid of metaphysics but that's just a purely semantic thing they basically do want to get rid of metaphysics um, um, uh, they yeah they just want to doing science um, but yeah I, I guess I my own views are more conciliatory um, in the sense that I um, I mean, it's similar to, as I said um, before, about being a naturalist without being a reductionist. So the idea that I think there are ways to appreciate and draw on the science um, without kind of um, idolizing or worshipping this view of science um, uh, that um, traditional sort of empiricists uh, uh, did I think I basically I think I think there's room for rationalism and empiricism in science. Thank you, Zoe. I I, I just would like to make one comment that um, when I wrote about this uh, relationship between metaphysics and naturalism, I also was worried about the limits of metaphysics because. I think that many metaphysicians uh, want, not everyone, but many of them want to, to think freely. And in, in that sense, I am still an, an empiricist because I think that our thought should have some limits. And uh, if you don't establish these limits, it's... We, it's dangerous, I think, <laughs> in some sense. Uh, but I don't know if you if you want to answer that also. No, I was just thinking I'd really like to read your paper, so I will I will look it up online and I will email you if I have any problems finding it um, because I'd like okay. to read it. Thank you. Okay, it's a very short, but okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so we have a, a, a final question here. I don't know if afterwards Nitamar wants also to to speak. Uh, this uh, Bar Carolo has another question about uh, meta models and daily thoughts. Uh, how does the intellect translate? The daily, daily, what's daily? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> common sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he means. Maybe common sense. How you translate common sense in a model? Maybe is that the question? OK, yeah, um, I think I understand this. Yeah, I think uh, if I if I'm getting it right, there's something here about our everyday view of the mind um, versus our scientific view of the mind. So what's sometimes called the manifest image over the scientific image. Our manifest image of the world involves chairs and tables and houses and cars. Our scientific image of the world says, no, there's just, you know, atoms arranged table wise or something. Um, and we can ask the same questions about the mind. So the manifest image, how it appears to us, is that all the important mental stuff is conscious, um, that we know what we are thinking, um, that um, our behaviour can be explained and predicted in terms of beliefs and desires. Um, and yeah, there's an interesting question about how this relates to our scientific image and what we should do if there's tension between the two. Um, so I'm, yeah, I, I remain reasonably neutral on the relationship between our folk psychological uh, approach to the mind and our scientific approach, largely because I think it's not as important as some people thought it was. So I think there was a very much a, a, a tendency uh, around the, the mid 1980s to um, assume that your metaphysics of mind kind of stands or falls uh, according to your semantics. So that if it's if it's it can only be true. Claims about your, your beliefs and desires causing your actions can only be true if there are um, actual uh, reductions of those states in your brain. And so this is something that the Churchlands kind of pushed against. They said, look, there's nothing um, about the way that the brain processes information which looks anything like belief and desire talk. Therefore, we should expect belief and desire talk to go away. We should just expect to get rid of our um, everyday approaches to the mind. Um, it's like talk of witchcraft or whatever. It's things, you know, old fashioned ways of talking. And now we know the science, we get rid of them. Now, I, um, I guess I don't agree with that because I think it requires too close a connection between the truth values of our statements and our semantics and our metaphysics. Um, and so um, I think that there's a whole host of different ways that the two can be related um, and so that we shouldn't draw conclusions about one from the other. Um, I mean, it, it raises really interesting questions. Of what what are we doing when we say um, Oh, he went to the refrigerator because he believed there was water in it and he desired water. I mean, what are we saying if we're not actually talking about um, people's internal states? And I basically think there's a whole host of options there and that we need to kind of separate out thinking about language um, from thinking about um, the nature of the mind. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Zoe. Maybe Nitamar wants to say some words. Still, uh, say something. Right. Or yeah. Well, because, uh, because I, if, I, if not, right, I, we will close I, the session. Okay. Right. I totally agree with uh, Zoe. Uh, this is in Husserlian terms, phenomenological terms, the natural attitude as opposed to the uh, theoretical scientific attitude. And uh, uh, this is a very interesting uh, situation when we were having a discussion, you know, some philosophers with uh, scientists, uh, particularly uh, physicists, and uh, the question that was raised to the physicists, we are talking about chairs, tables, you know, uh, and uh, material objects, 
in our uh, everyday uh, handling uh, of objects in, in this world of uh, visible things. We are not talking about atoms and uh, electron, electrons and uh, positrons, etc. Because in everyday language, even physicists and scientists, they talk about chairs and tables and stones, etc. Right? You're not always talking about H2O and, uh, you know, you don't go into the uh, molecular constitution of a stone tables and chairs. It's simply that uh, it has to do precisely with the way we also talk about everyday handlings in the world. It's, it's very much the, the idea of a pragmatism, right? The way we handle our environment or our relationships with people is uh, in everyday language, both in terms of syntax and semantics, but especially semantics, because it means, as, as Zoe just said, that we have intentionality and we are meaning something. Some words are meant by uh, speakers, right? So it, it's not exactly the uh, theoretical or uh, uh, scientific approach to uh, the objects of science. Thank you very much. It was very good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nita Mar. Thank you, especially Zoe uh, Dreisson. And now I, Marco will say something to close the, the colloquium. Is that right, Marco? Yes, yes. Yes, actually, I, I, I have this uh, uh, obligation or commitment to close the, the colloquium. But first, uh, a quick commentary to Zoe's presentation. Uh, it was wonderful. And uh, I think uh, when you were presenting, I remember uh, a presentation of Stephen Darrow's about uh, the place of philosophy and ethics. Uh, it's a, uh, the, uh, he delivered a conference in a, uh, I think 10 years ago or more, uh, in, uh, in the American Society of Philosophy and, and Darwin was th thinking about uh, why we still say that uh, uh, ethics is part of philosophy. Uh, because um, physics is not part of philosophy, etc. is not part of philosophy, but why ethics is part of philosophy and he studied ethics. And, and I remember and discussed that with my colleagues uh, I, I wonder about bioethics because I, I, I study bioethics and I wonder about uh, why uh, in bioethics and I, 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 I make the statement crude that actually bioethics is not part of philosophy. Bioethics began uh, a part of philosophy. Philosophers uh, make a part of bioethics. And so uh, uh, agreeing, disagreeing with Darrow say that bioethics uh, is not a part of philosophy, and 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 it doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't matter or it shouldn't be part of philosophy. It, it seems to me that what you say about cognitive science is, is similar. Uh, if we if we ask that cognitive science is part of philosophy, um, uh, your answer is simply that no, it's not part of philosophy. It, it, it actually it began uh, as a multidisciplinary enterprise. Philosophy is part of that. And maybe now philosophers are wondering uh, what kind of part they deserve in the field. Uh, and so uh, we are always, as philosophers, thinking about that. Even me, that is a physician, uh, when I am a philosopher, I think about what, what the contribution of philosophers in this field, uh, in the field of bioethics, in the field of medicine, and now in the field of cognitive science. And fortunately, we have philosophers in the field. And fortunately, uh, maybe we can still have a place in, the, in there. So thank you, uh, Zoe, for your presentation. And thank you. Uh, I, I apologize for not uh, having you with us. Actually, it's not a fault of us. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's incumbent on the COVID-19 and the pandemic. We have we had money to bring you about with us, but uh, we shouldn't, uh, we couldn't. And so, uh, can I, uh, 
We apologize. Uh, say. <laughs> no, I would like to comment one of your statements, statements about how, how our role in cognitive science. And because I have some students that are already, I would say, working in cognitive science in multidisciplinary departments, you know, and uh, we have a, a kind of lab. We have a lab in Unicinos and there we, we did some experiments and with people from neuroscience, from other departments and I would say that we have many tasks that philosophers can do in cognitive science. <laughs> I, 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 w I was very pleased to see that Zoe uh, wants to make a list of what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think this list would be very large. <laughs> and, and I think one of the main tasks is to think about uh, many hypotheses uh, and and concepts. I would say, if I may <laughs> say, because um, I see that philosophers are very good at uh, creating highly abstract hypotheses and also to, to define better some neurological concepts. And I think this, this can really help in, in, in experiments. Uh, I just want to say that before you close our, <laughs> I don't know if Zoe want to comment that. <laughs> I agree with everything you said. So thank you, Sophia. <laughs> okay. Well, I really uh, uh, hope that we will have uh, an opportunity to invite you uh, presently <laughs> to Brazil and to see our, not only our country, but our place here in the South. Uh, and thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you, Nitamar. Uh, yeah, we, we want always to have uh, close uh, proximity with Pulkers and you, Nitamar, uh, you helped us uh, a lot uh, commentating uh, Zoe. And uh, I want to uh, uh, thank all my people, my uh, the members of my research group. Bianca is in front of me, actually in front of me in this kind of <laughs> phenomenological situation. Marcelli also and uh, also Fernando. Fernando, I think, as I said, is actually the real, real coordinator of the event. And uh, I really appreciate and, uh, and, and I want to uh, thank all other people uh, uh, that participated uh, in the organization of this uh, very uh, busy and uh, uh, tired some in some sense event. Uh, but I, I hope all of us uh, could uh, think about the different issues we try to combine. Uh, and we have a lot of topics to discuss and rediscuss, etc. And so thank you a lot. Thank you, Luis Roden. Luis Roden, unfortunately, couldn't uh, be with us uh, now. He is the coordinator of the graduate program. And in the name of the uh, our coordinator, I I... I officially uh, close the event. Uh, thank and let's keep in touch, Zoe, please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was really, bye, really bye. Thank, thank you. All. Thank you.